Welcome to the third and final part of the lecture series on the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture from my master's degree. And so last time we talked about the L function and we defined it as a Dirichlet series. And so for instance this is a Dirichlet series where the, the coefficients are just one on top constantly. <coughs> and this is evaluated at s equals one. So Okay, so my point on showing this slide again is to show that Dirichlet series have a uh, Euler product expansion. You can always write a Dirichlet series, you can always write it out as a product. And so instead of showing what, how that works exactly for the L function, I'm just going to I'm just going to define it as the end result. So for instance, we're going to start right here. Yeah, I showed you all the other slides, so don't worry about that. But here's the here's how we're defining the L function. So here's what you get when you expand that uh, that Dirichlet series into a product. You get this. You get a product of products, product of two products. And remember last time how we talked about how the there's a finite number of bad p because if you go far enough out, then the discriminant then p won't divide the discriminant because p will be bigger than the discriminant. So that's that. So there's a finite number of bad p. So this product, we can consider just the good p because there's a finite number of bad p. It's not going to affect what we're interested in, which is the order of the vanishing of the L function. This thing will never be zero. And you can convince yourself of that if you write down what we talked about last time on the ace of p's for the bad p's and that sort of thing. So it's not going to it's not going to be zero and it's finite, so it's not going to affect the order of vanishing of this guy. So we just look at this right here. And so we're about to present a heuristic argument on why the Birch and Swinerton Dyer like, kind of should be true, an idea behind why it should be true. Now strictly speaking, uh, this this product will only converge, remember, when the real part of s is greater than 3 halves. But we're going to plug in 1 and see what we get. And then kind of hopefully provide some intuition on why they felt like the, the, the their conjecture should be true. So when we plug in 1, we get this into the L function. And if we multiply by p over p, we get this. And then, if we remember our formula, how we define the ace of p's, that was this, defined before. And then we just invert, invert the fraction. So we get this as our final result. So this is kind of the punchline to the idea behind the whole conjecture. So the idea is this. If the rank is zero, then the what that literally means is that there are only a finite point, finite number of points on the elliptic curve in, over the rationals. And so we would expect that there wouldn't be that many points on the elliptic curve when we reduce that mod p compared to if the rank was 1 or, or higher. So again, if the rank is 1, that literally means that there are an infinite number of points on the elliptic curve with rational coordinates. So we think that if we reduce the curve mod p for that for the elliptic curve of with infinite an infinite number of points that there would be more points total um, on the elliptic curve mod p. In other words if the rank is one or greater this should be bigger if the one is zero, if the if the rank is zero, then we would expect this to be smaller. So this product goes to zero if this ratio is, in some sense, um, less than one. If you keep taking a ratio less than one, that's going to go to zero. And if it's like rank zero, then we would expect it not to be less than one, essentially. So that's kind of the idea. Hope that made sense. Kind of might take a little while to reflect over. And just to point out something, this ratio kind of makes sense that the denominator could be bigger than the numerator because there are p choices for the x-coordinate and p choices for the y-coordinate. 
so there's a p squared possibilities for the denominator so it makes sense why it, it could possibly be bigger on the denominator and uh, but remember the size of the elliptic curve now this is the strange part remember that the size of the elliptic curve will always be pretty close to p because of Hass's theorem that we talked before about before the difference between p plus one and this guy here is always going to be less than or equal to uh, two root p so it's always bounded in some sense so they're always going to be close but we would expect this to be a little bit bigger when we when the rank is positive when they're an infinite number of points and we would expect this to be a little bit smaller when the rank is zero and there are only a finite number of points um, over the rationals so after we reduce it it should be smaller we hope so that's that and this is just to give you a little connection here that uh, the zeta function that we have defined before this is uh, p over p minus one that's a uh, that's the one we talked about before. Just to show you that it's, they kind of look similar. There's always kind of this correlation between the zeta function and the L function for elliptic curves. They look very similar. They're both Dirichlet series and so forth. All right. Now, this is pretty cool, I think. This was an afternoon of reflection for me on uh, to believe it, but I think I got it, so I'm going to try to explain it to you. So if the conjecture is true, that means that the two ranks are equal, analytic and algebraic. So it turns out there's a conjecture, there's a uh, an algorithm to compute the rank. So we can pin down the rank given an elliptic curve. And the idea is to use the algebraic side to bound the rank uh, below and use the analytic side that we just talked about for the L function to bound the rank above. And then we want to eventually show that they're, those two are equal using this algorithm. And that will mean that the ranks equals, you know, whatever they're, whatever they agree on. If something is up, um, at most and at least the same number, then it must be that number. That's the idea. So the algebraic side, if we have three points that are independent, if we found three points that each generate an independent integral dimension, there's no overlap, there's only trivial overlap with any of the other points, then the, the algebraic rank must be at least three because each one of those span an integral dimension. So the group will be isomorphic to z to the third power cross some torsion piece that we're not really interested in. And then on the analytic side, we're going to bound it above. So this is the part that's kind of interesting. So it there is an algorithm to evaluate the rth derivative of L at s equals one for any to any degree of accuracy. We can't evaluate it exactly. If we could, that this would be very easy. But basically using computers, we can estimate any derivative of L at s equals 1 and it'll give us some interval like this for instance. Now if this interval does not include 0 then we can be sure that the L function is not 0. If, if that if that R derivative at s equals 1 is not 0 that means the order of vanishing is, let me see if I get this right, at most R. So remember the order of vanishing, that's the first derivative that's non-zero. Okay, so then we can bound it above in that way. So eventually we use this algorithm to look for points and hopefully we'll find, well eventually we will find um, enough independent points and then we keep evaluating our L function, our rth derivative of the L function for lower and lower values and come up with some bound above for our, for our, uh, for our first non-vanishing derivative. The tricky thing here is that when you do get something that includes zero, like let's say we got L of 3 was uh, like negative 0.05 to 0.05 or something like that. 
Well, in that case, we can't be sure that it is zero, even though it should be, um, even, or even though it could possibly be. So in this case, if the rank's going to be at least three, then we, then that would not be a good interval because we should get an interval that does not include three. But if you get something that includes zero, then you can't be sure that if it's zero or not zero. So that's why we can only use the analytic side to bound the rank above. Because if our inter interval doesn't include zero, then we know that it's at most that R that we chose. If our interval does include zero, then that doesn't give us any information. That's inconclusive. So that's why we need to use the uh, algebraic side to bound it below. And you can't just rely on the analytic side. So that's the, that's the idea. If you have questions, feel free to let me know on any of this stuff. I'd be happy to answer it. I present it in a couple days. Pretty excited about that. So, and uh, here's the main resources that I used for this talk. Lawrence Washington's book, really good book. Um, it's, it's, he breaks things down really good uh, and uh, presents things really well. Same with William Stein. So, his this book is that doesn't go as deep. It's the his book. It, Lawrence Washington book is his book is uh, just about elliptic curves. William Stein's book, the sixth chapter, covers elliptic curves. I did also use something from William Stein, uh, computations, a computational approach to the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, which I was able to understand some of chapter one. After that, I was lost. But anyways, so like I said, feel free to let me know um, anything, any thoughts and ideas that came into your mind about these elliptic curve stuff, and uh, take care.